We're still in the COVID. I got my mask, so I'll get rid of it for a Sunday school lesson. <coughs> and we say good morning again. I'm Brother Tillerson, and we are in the book of Jeremiah. <clears throat> the lesson today is called Practice Justice. Let us have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for giving us sound minds and the inspiration to study your word. We ask, Holy Spirit, to guide us to receive the message that God <clears throat> has given us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. For the last few weeks, our lessons have been primarily on the topics of justice and injustice. Today's topic, practice justice, is a desire for many people today. One day, we learn about a murder that occurred, young man, Ahmad, Aubrey, in Georgia, by two men. It took over two months before they were charged. A few days later, we hear about the Justice Department of the United States dropping a charge against uh, Donald Trump's first national security advisor, Michael Flynn, who admitted to lying to the FBI. Similar situations have occurred <clears throat> in times past. So people ask themselves, where is the justice? Where is the justice? <clears throat> you know, in a courtroom situation, if attorneys are having argument before the judge, and sometimes there's a dispute, sometimes the judge will call for a sidebar. Let's have a sidebar just for a moment. How do you think God looks at us, his creation, his children? How does he look at us? He doesn't look at us by color or anything of that nature because the scripture says when we're all called, we're going to have celestial bodies, bodies of all that only God can make. He's going to raise them from the dead. And those that are still living, he'll raise them always. Also, so we'll see that God doesn't take any situation differently. He looks at all of us equally. There are times <clears throat> when we come face to face with negative consequences in our lives. Those times can be most devastating, sometimes very frightening, in fact. Perhaps you've been in school and re just had something terrible happen to you. And <clears throat> the surprise is that you may be penalized for that situation. And you might say or tell the teacher that it's totally unfair. But in situations like that, we have to learn a lesson. And God gives us a lesson in this scripture today. We are very extremely valuable to God. He wants us to focus on him. He's given us all an assignment to represent him. We are his chosen people, and we have to act like it. Amen? So our lesson today is from the book of Jeremiah, as I said. Jeremiah, the question is, is he considered a minor prophet or a major prophet? We'll see in a moment. His name means, and I have two translations for his name, his name means Jehovah appoints or sends, or Yahweh throws or hurls. And in these chaotic times, sometimes you can consider throwing the nations into judgment for their sins. He is known also as the weeping prophet. And this is characterized as great sorrow, for he had people who rejected God's message. Injustice, lawlessness, violence, oppression flooded the society during Jeremiah's time. It sounds like I'm talking about the day, doesn't it? Amen? But Jeremiah is considered a major prophet. He preached for 40 years. He was never married. And you may recall about three or four weeks ago, we talked about the prophet Isaiah. And he preached for 52 years. So they both dedicated them, 
themselves to doing what God asked them to do. Remember the uh, comedian that used to have a TV show long ago called Arsenio Hall? He always would say, hmm, well, let's think about it today. And no matter how young we are, no matter how old we are, we can still look what happened with Jeremiah. He was called to preach early in Jeremiah. Verse, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. It reads, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I shall send you. And whatever I command, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you. I will deliver you. This is the word of God in Jeremiah 1, 6 through 8. And Jeremiah also wrote the book of Lamentations. So just prior to starting our scriptures for today, today's lesson, Jeremiah said to King Adonai, he read this message, or he gave this message. It's in Jeremiah 21, verses 4 through 7. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said. I am about to turn against you. The weapons of war that are in your hands, which you are using to fight the king of Babylon and the Babylonians who are outside the walls besieging you. And I will gather them inside the city. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm in anger and fury and great wrath. I will strike down the mighty, uh, uh, I will strike down those who live in this city, both men and animals, and they will die a terrible plague. A terrible plague. This is God. And after that, declares the Lord, I will hand over Zedekiah, king of Judah, his officials, and the people in his city who survived the plague, who survived the sword, who survived famine, and I'll hand them over to King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and to their enemies who seek their lives. He will put them to the sword. He will show them no mercy, no pity, no compassion. This is what Jeremiah is facing right now. God is not happy. God is very, very upset. We can say the same thing today. All the things that are going on in this world, God is very upset. And all we can ask for God is his forgiveness. Amen? But this is the paradox we're, we're dealing with. This is the dilemma. So in verse 8, our first verse says, And unto this people thou shalt say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you a way of life and a way of death. God has given us all a choice, a way of life and a way of death. We're going to look at this a little bit more. Deuteronomy 30, 15 says, See, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. We all have a choice. God graciously, however, provides a way of escape. He could have simply said, destroy them, destroy them, which would have been entirely justified because, you know, in Romans 3.23, it says the wages of sin is what? Death. The wages of sin is death. But instead, he tells them that there still remains a way of life. And for Israel, the way of life involves obedience. Obedience to God's word. Obedience to God's command. It means loving him, fearing him, and serving him. Their failure to task is caused them now to face a God who is totally upset. He is ready to set forth his judgment. God sets forth an alternative one last time here in this lesson. Life, one more time. Life. One more time. 
So we get a chance to see the choice. We all have this choice. Let us talk about choices. We've all been in situations in the past where we had to make choices. The choice here is are we going to follow God's word? During the day, days of uh, Jeremiah, the people were presented this situation. Jesus, in the New Testament, speaks about life and death as a choice between a wide gate and a narrow gate or a straight gate. When you look at Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, it says, enter into the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, for many will enter through that. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only few find it. God wants all of us to find that road to life. Amen? Each of us have been called to take a particular path. We have to make a choice. And it should be a no-brainer. It should be. But obvious is not always obvious to all of us. Amen? Proverbs 3, 5 and 7 says that we have to trust. Trust in the Lord with all our heart. And lean not to our own understanding. And in all thy ways acknowledge him. And he shall do what? Direct thy path. Amen. So, even though it's not a no-brainer, many of us still have a problem choosing the right course, the right path. And we have to seek his wisdom so that we will know which direction to take. Only following Jesus Christ leads to life. John 14, 6 says that I am the way, I am the truth, and the light, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. We have to trust in the Lord. It's easy as ABC on the outside, but we get so distracted on the inside that we don't know which direction to take sometimes. But we got to stay focused on the Lord. So God is describing this way of life and this way of death in this lesson for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Those who choose to remain in the city and hide behind the walls during the Babylonian siege will face death. It is certain God has said that. All three of these things, the sword, famine, and pestilence will bring about death due to the lack of rain, due to diseases and plagues. All three of these covenant fears are discussed early on in the Old Testament, in Leviticus 26 and in Deuteronomy 28. But we have to remain loyal to the king, to our Father in heaven. There are these three things, the sword, which refers to war, the famine, which refers to lack of food, and the, pestil the pestilences, which refer to diseases or plagues, all are also mentioned again in Jeremiah 14, 2, or 14, 12. But God is making it plain. He makes it simple for us that we have to hear him. And not only hear him, but we have to fear him in such a way that we do what he's asking us to do. So think about the choice. How would you choose? You know, there's a TV show. Say, so what would you do in a situation that is presented where they have fake actors um, on the show, and they're basically explaining a situation, and people can overhear, and they want to know, how are you going to, are you going to step up and represent God in that situation? Well, we have to do that. We have to be able to step up and represent God in every situation that we're confronted with. Amen? All right. There's a word in the verse that's, that uses the word fallen. F-A-L-L-E-T-H. In this bird, it refers to falling to the ground before the enemy in an act of submission or surrender. They will not survive by fighting, but by giving themselves up. So surrender is a spiritual principle that we all need to learn. When we struggle against God, our only hope of surrender is 
just doing it the way he wants us to do it. That's how we get success. Typically, the word prey refers to the spoil or capture of goods after a city is destroyed. And that has happened in many times in the Old Testament. But God's ways are just sometimes quite different from what we would ever think. God is calling his people to trust him for the way of escape. Even when he is breaking the judgment, we have to trust in him. Now, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the B clause says, God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able. But he will, with temptation, also make a way of escape. They will have to bear it. Amen? Now let's look at verse 10. For it says, I have set my face against the city for evil, and not for good, saith the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. Well, you know, we have a situation here. There is always a situation that we have to confront. You remember the little advertisement the boy calls his mom and says, Mom, I have a situation here. Well, we have a situation. God, in this instance, will work evil against his own people. And the people are in shock. The people are in shock. And they are upset. But evil here should not be understood as morally detestable. The concept is really related to the word like cursing, especially in contrast of doing good, because doing good is the blessing. God's harm is not intended only as retribution, it is intended to correct. And that's what our parents try to do to us. They try to help us in a situation to correct us so that we're not falling away. All right. Sometimes God's wrath, though, is purely retribution in nature. In those cases, God's wrath is punishment, simply because the one who received the punishment deserved it. We all know when we deserve punishment. Amen? You know, when you look at the Revelations, in Revelations 21, uh, verse 8, it reads, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire. We do not want to be in contact with that situation at all. We are looking for the book of life. Amen? Amen. So Judah's preference to believe that God will punish only the enemies of the Jews and thereby always deliver Judah is unfounded because this shows how badly they misunderstand what God is doing here. God is always going to be faithful. His judgment results in actions of a people and their rulers who have received God's word and they reject him. They reject him. Are we rejecting God today? Hopefully not. But there are some that are rejecting God today. They are without excuse and they are repeatedly rejecting God's word. Do you think the rejections of God's word in the United States and in the world are increasing or decreasing? It seems to me that they are increasing every day. We have to be mindful of it. We sometimes just need to say, hmm, and just mar marinate on that thought. Amen? All right. Let's look at verses 11 and 12. It says, And touching the house of the king of Judah, say, Hear ye the word of the Lord. O house of David, thus saith the Lord. It says, execute judgment in the morning and deliver him that is spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor. Lest my fury go out like fire and burn none can quench it because of the evil of your doing. See, the previous two 
verses 8 through 10, God provided one last opportunity for the people to escape their lives. Now he turns back to address the royals and the officials in the house of David. Some people just did not accept Jeremiah's counsel as coming from the Lord and surrendered themselves to the Babylonians, but they still suffered God's hand of judgment. Although they did not lose their lives, they lost everything that they owned, all their possessions. So this kind of justice God has in mind is that kings ought to come to the defense of those who have been robbed, those who need to be delivered, from those who have been oppressed. The judgment spoken here is understood in the legal sense. The legal sense being adhering to the law of Moses with regard to how people should be treated. We all know how should people should be treated. We want to be treated a certain way as well. But we have to remember those that are vulnerable. The phrase in the verse that says in the morning implies daily or regularly. Every morning. Do we pray every day? Should we pray every day? Are, are our lives so busy that we forget to pray a day or two or more? We need to have a little routine if we're down on our knees in the morning or at night or whatever it may be. We need to make sure that is a part of our routine. The king of Israel is to perform justice and righteousness throughout the land, maintaining God's laws and promoting economic and social welfare. That's what the king is doing, supposed to be doing. He has his eye on the entire population, just like God has his eyes on all of us. Turning a blind eye to the plight of the poor, however, is such a great evil that God will unleash his wrath on us. We have to be aware that he could come just like a raging fire at any time. We need to be mindful because we've been blessed so that we are, can be in a position to help others. Amen? So the question is, would you want equity or equality in justice? Think about that. Would you want equity or equality in justice? Equity is not the same as equality. These verses express that the leaders should treat everyone the same. Equality. Also, these verses compel the leaders to right any wrongs and do more to help those who have been mistreated. Don't you think people are being mistreated today in this pandemic? You better believe it. There is equity and there is equality. So making the type of justice a priority aligns with God's values and prevents God's wrath from breaking out on behalf of the marginalized, those that are in need. So that's what we have to remember, that we shall be working toward not a lack of equity, but equity itself. Now let's look at verses 13 and 14. It reads, Behold, I am against thee, O inhabitant of the valley and the rock of the plain, saith the Lord, which say, Who shall come down against us? Or who shall enter into our habitations? But I will punish you according to the fruits of your doings, saith the Lord. And I will kindle the fire in the forest thereof, and it shall devour all things round about thee. Now here, God, <laughs> when I read this, this really made a point. God continues to describe the judgment that he's going to bring against the kings of Judah and on the whole city. In the previous verse, God had given them a strong warning encouraging them to just change their ways, to avoid the judgment. But here it becomes clear now, 
God has set the verdict. He has already done it. And he has said they have failed. And God's judgment will be certain. And God is saying the same thing today. What we have to do, we have to repent. We have to repent from our evil ways. We have to repent. I like to Let's see where I put it. Second Chronicles 7.14. Second Chronicles 7.14. Go and take a look at that this week. The people of the city are overconfident in this situation. The question of who shall come down against us indicates just how little they understand vulnerability. The attitude is especially astounding given the fact that God is saying he is going to fight against them. He is going to fight against the people. So when the Lord passes judgment like that, according to the fruit of their doing, he cannot be stopped. The Lord cannot be stopped. He instructed Jeremiah to go down to the king's palace and proclaim this message. This message of specific items. Number one, the message was from the Lord himself. Number two, God demanded that everyone execute righteousness throughout the land. When he does that, People are not going to harm each other. They're not going to commit murder and do all these things that take place in our society today. The third point is that both obedience and disobedience have results and consequences. We have to be cognizant of that. And number four, the coming judgment was due to the people's disobedience. God was going to destroy it because of the people's sin. And it will also happen again. So as we look at these four points, we should make those four points part of our daily lives. So in conclusion, God's message to King Zedekiah is a warning for us all. God has always and will continue to judge sin. Not because he enjoys punishing us or his children, but because he loves us. Amen? A little discipline for his children will go a long way. Let us pray. Father, remind us daily that it's either the narrow way of life or the wide gate of destruction. Let our judgment run down as waters of righteousness as a mighty stream. Please keep us safe from the COVID-19 virus and help us to understand its purpose. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's a little something to make you smile, real short. The 85-year-old couple, excellent health, died in a car crash. Of course, they went to heaven. St. Peter took them to their mansion with the massive bath and the jacuzzi and just the full work. And the other husband asked, how much does this cost? And he told them, it's free. This is heaven. He went out back and saw the magnificent golf course, which they could play on every day. How much to play? It's free. This is heaven. They saw the clubhouse, buffet, food beyond imagination. How much to eat? It's free. This is heaven. Then the man just got upset. And he told his wife, I just can't believe this. And she said, what's wrong, husband? What's wrong? He said, it's all your fault. If I hadn't eaten all those bread muffins you gave me, I could have been here 10 years ago. Amen. Amen. You all have a blessed day. His brother told us to sign off. Sunday school, Sunday school, First Baptist Church, Denver. Thank you.